Okay, so it's not signed on the front, but all of the paintings are signed on the back. The second criteria I have, and this was the strictest one, is if this is the only painting someone ever saw of my work, do I feel like it would be representational of who I am as an artist? Okay, and so that criteria really sobers me up in the editing process because it can be a painting that it's like, eh, I like it. It'd be okay, but if that was the only painting someone ever saw of my work, do I feel like that it represents me as an artist? And many, many times that answer is no. So when I want to show this painting, and I think this is unusual and why I wanted to do this, is most artists don't want to ever expose their failures. They want, don't want to talk about the process. Um, they want to have people believe that art is this magical, ethereal thing, that you have the final product, there was never any kind of mess or mayhem that had to be uh, uh, incurred in order to create that. And so this is a process that I call the reverse Richter. So when you're going to school, art school, you're taught, especially in painting, and how you're taught and how you learn is to copy other artists. And so you're learning brush strokes from there, you're looking at applications, you're looking at color theory. That's what they're trying to teach you in doing that. So if you're going to be, color, you know, uh, uh, be copying Impressionist, or you're going to copy Picasso, um, or even some of the more modernist, the color field, what you're learning is application theory at that time. So this is what I call a reverse Richter because when I was learning how to paint and going through the process of copying, my instructor pulled me inside and said, listen, you are not gonna stop here. This is how you learn how to paint, but this is a foundation by which I want you to go and continue to explore your own methodologies, your own processes, so that you come out with your own unique outcomes. And so Gerhard Richter, for those of you who are art historians and, and know him as an artist, his claim to fame was he piled on a bunch of painting onto a canvas, and then his process was to scrape that painting off of the canvas to reveal the painting below. So that is, um, I call this a reverse Richter because this process is, is not scraping the painting off the painting, it's actually scraping the painting onto the painting. And so this was unrefined for me because this was a study. So when I start doing a painting, I'll start with smaller colors. I'm mixing my colors. I'm looking at the layers and applications, how much drying time. I'm looking at the texture behind it. There's a lot of things I do with the study. Then when I feel like I've got that mastered at a point that I can do a full scale or full size, then I do that. So this was the full size scale study. This is the final painting that's actually in the exhibit that's hanging on the curved mezzanine of the stairs. And so there's a very, very different application of the paint, the textures, and so it was many, many layers going into creating this effect. And so it's a little hard to tell with the slide, but when you see it in person, um, you'll see the difference. And, and I didn't have the luxury of being able to hang the two together in the exhibit, but I did want to show the slide. So for, I'll go back, go forward. Okay, can you all see the difference and the different application? Now, some of you will probably prefer the prior painting. <laughs> That's the way art is, it's subjective, right? What we, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. These are broader uses of the color. It's a more pooled effect of the color. This is a much more um, lighter texture, light, lighter hand, if, if to say. So this process and the way that I wanted to accomplish this with the metallic colors, with the multiple layers, there is more than 50 layers of paint on this painting, okay? So each one of those layers and it's each color being mixed intermixing with the other layer. Sometimes I let it dry in between the layers and sometimes I let the layers meld together. And so this is one of those processes where even if I wanted to copy the painting again, I couldn't directly because that day the way, you know, humidity, the amount of mica flake that I have mixed in to the paint, the one and done artist. So once I've painted something, I will never paint it again. 
And the reason I do that is at my price point, I want a client to have a unique, original, fine piece of art. What I don't want them to ever do is walk into a gallery or someone else's home and see that exact same painting. And so that's for me and my journey, that's my personal um, aesthetic as, a, as an artist. That's not necessarily the right track for every artist, but um, that is one of the things. So this particular painting, that size, that coloration will never be repeated again. So another painting that is, um, I wanna talk about is in the refinement process. And uh, so there is a painting upstairs. This is the painting that's upstairs. Okay, it's on the mezzanine. So this is a reductionist process. This painting measures nine feet by 12 feet across. For the 12 panels that um, I, I did for this painting, more than 40 were painted. Okay, so the reductionist process is one where it, this is my printmaking coming into play, is because I'm having to start with the end in mind and I'm working backwards. So instead of adding paint to create my painting, I'm actually reducing the paint or scraping the paint off. So this process took me years to master because the first thing is to etch the paint. I was using uh, tools that were too sharp and it was cutting the canvas. Okay, then too dull and it wasn't actually etching through the paint. And then because I like to add an extra layer of complication, I, I use a silver stylus actually that is actually laying down a microbead of silver within each one of those lines. And the first show that this uh, painting was ever in, someone asked me like, what machine makes of those lines? And it's like, this machine, <laughs> this machine makes all this, those lines. And so for an artist, if you need precision, that's something that's fairly easy to accomplish because you can measure it. If you want random, that's fairly easy too because it's random. The hardest thing for an artist to accomplish is consistently random. So if you look at this painting, all of those lines, if I was too heavy handed in one area, if I had too many lines in one area. And so the p other complexity for this painting is the fact that I had to do it flat, but then composing all the panels had to be done on a wall. So it really limited my studio space. I had to have very high walls, I had to have very big walls in order to compose a lot of these paintings. But the prior slide is the study. This is a six foot by nine foot painting. Um, this study is actually, uh, was sold. And, um, but if you look at the difference, this was the first generation of it. And why this, this uh, exhibit is called Evolution is I could have stopped there and that could have been the final painting, but it wasn't, wasn't good enough for me. It's like, I think I can refine this, I can push it further. And so that's the next painting. You can see it's more refined, it's more polished, there's more composition to it. And so that is one of the hardest techniques to do because while I am d reducing the painting, it's drying. Okay, so I can put what's called a paint retardant in the paint to slow down the drying process. But retardant is one of the difficult mediums because it dries inconsistently then. So part of the painting will be dry, but part of it won't, which is why it took so many panels to get to these 12 panels. So um, I wanna divert to talk about inspiration because that's one of the questions I get asked quite a bit. What was the inspiration point behind this painting? So I love to read, I've always loved to read, and I read a lot of weird, obscure articles. And this was a scientific journal about scientists who decided to photograph the sound waves of different musics. And so what they learned was classical music will create different sound waves than jazz or blues or hip hop or reggae, all these different waves. And so they had the photographs attached to this article of these different sound waves. And so that is what kind of started me on this journey of this linear thought. At the same time, I read an article about these Japanese fishermen and how they uh, would hand knit and create the uh, netting. And so filament is what they use in order to create the nets and filament management <laughs> is an issue because if that gets under control, it gets knotted, then you don't have a net, right? Or if the net isn't strong enough to pull the fish in. And so these two articles and interest points intersected to be the inspiration point for me to create this painting. So the idea of filament management, but the idea of different ways, 
And so one of the recurring themes that you'll see in my work, you'll see it in the tour when we do later, is in, in circles. And so I have a series about rings. And um, circles are the universal symbol. It's, it's important in um, every culture. You see circles in, every, in, the, um, in many, many different types of works. And so one of the things I love about circles as an artist is they're technically difficult to execute. And so to get a completely perfect circle is very, very difficult to execute. And so it forces me as an artist to embrace my imperfections. It forces me as an artist to, to really challenge myself. And from the failure standpoint, I cannot tell you how many circles I've had that have failed. I have shredded many, many of them. And it's always heartbreaking when, when that happens. But the failure part of being an artist is being able to say, what did I learn from this process? Was I impatient? And I was trying to push and manipulate the paint faster than it wanted to be. Was, I, uh, was my technique incorrect? Was I being sloppy? Did I not mix this perfectly and, and stir it as much as I really needed to? There's a lot of lessons that I've been able to learn in that process. So anyway, I wanted to show the, I'll show it again, the study, the final painting. And so uh, because I had this opportunity, I'm going to be a, a rogue here, and I'm going to show you a painting that's not an exhibit. <laughs> so this is a study of a painting that is not here. But this goes to, again, the failure um, and learning what we learn as artists in failing. So this is a study. This is the final painting. So this is a 9 by 15 foot painting. Um, it's been in a, a, a few different galleries and on exhibit in different places. Right now it's in, um, I think it's in Austin. And um, so this is a, 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 a process that again is a very high failure rate process. So this is actually using um, different techniques for the matte paint, the, the dark part of it is an ultra matte where I have to paint and sand and paint and sand multiple times in order to get the ultra matte. So what I'm basically doing is taking the polish off of the paint in order to do that. And then I'm using a series of glazes in order to create the stripes, so this tone and tone effect. The challenge with working with this glaze is I can brush it once. If I go back over to brush it a second time to correct it, it dries white. But I don't know it dries white until it's dried. So for this panel of 15, uh, for this painting, I had to do more than 30. And so more than half of those, it's like, why is it a 15 panel painting? Those were the 15 <laughs> panels that turned out. And so that's part of the fun of being an artist is I could kind of look at different outcomes and, and what I call the happy accidents is that I actually got um, 15 panels that matched. I was really worried that I wasn't even gonna have that many as I could see things drying and Canvas is a natural organic material. There are slugs in the canvas that don't make themselves apparent until there's paint and glaze on top of that. And so this painting is not in the exhibit, but I wanted to, um, to, to show that because it talks to the tenacity that I think artists that we have to have, the comfort level that we have to, to, to embrace with failure. So one of the values I think of arts education is we have to be really good observers. And then we also have to embrace failure because I know for myself, even now after 40 plus years of painting, more than a third of my paintings still fail. And what I mean by that is that painting ends up getting shredded or painted over. So if I can upcycle a canvas, it's the smart, economic, and environmentally friendly thing to do. So there are many paintings that I have that have a painting or even two paintings underneath it. Some of the paintings, this particular painting, cannot be upcycled. I can't paint over it, and I can't do this painting over another painting. So it becomes a um, kind of a stressful <laughs> few days for me when I'm doing a painting like this. But it's one of um, my favorite processes because as an artist, I am really, really drawn toward these very, very tedious processes. Somebody asked about a, a piece that's in, I guess I have three different pieces that are the puzzle piece, and um, asked if they were multiple puzzles or if it was just one. And usually it's just one puzzle, type of puzzle, but it's multiple pieces. So there's a, a, a painting in the exhibit that is more than 6,000 puzzle pieces. 
I have a painting on exhibit at, um, at the Hall Arts Residence right now that's more than 11,000 puzzle pieces. I have a painting, we'll see a couple of the techniques for those of you who want to stay for the tour. It's a process that I call paint beading and there's more than 60,000 individual beads of paint that were used to create that painting. I've got a couple examples here that are only 20 or 30,000 um, paint beads. There's one right in the entry, uh, with the same type of thing where um, you know the artists that are the colorful artists that could cover a canvas in brush strokes in a matter of a few hours, sometimes even in a few minutes. Most of the paintings that I'm doing will take days, weeks, and sometimes even months. And so I, one of my very first puzzle piece painting that I did uh, was 3,500 vintage puzzle pieces. Um, it's a, unfortunately too, too delicate to have brought to um, the Irving Art Center because I don't have one spare piece. And so, um, but that particular piece is a vignette. And so it took me weeks just to even sort the pieces and then took weeks to compose the pieces. And then when I was uh, hearing the pieces and gluing them down, as I was picking them up and setting them back down, if I shifted them even slightly, I, didn't, I realized that the vignette lines were changing. And so two of the panels, I had to pry all the pieces off and redo them again. And so um, I will admit, weeks later, <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't decide if I loved that painting or hated that painting. We had to go in and time out for a while, so it was a love-hate relationship. It has since now become one of my, my favorite paintings, but um, it's part of all part of the artist's journey, and I think that artists are driven uh, to, to complete and to bring our, our vision into the world, to bring that into fruition, and I know for me, um, art is prayer, but it's also emotional nudity, but there's so much um, that, that we have to do as artists in order to overcome the obstacles that, that are in our world, all the distractions to get into the studio and to paint, to paint every day. And so uh, I had read somewhere where you need 10,000 hours to be proficient or be considered an expert at something. And so being the business-minded person that I am, and I love my spreadsheets, I'm like, well, I'm gonna calculate this. And I calculated over the 40 years of painting, I have more than 20,000 hours in the studio. So that has to be something that you love. It drives me, like I, I get itchy if I've been traveling and I've been gone for a few days and I can't, I can't paint, I'm just waiting to, to do that. So we're getting close to the 12.30 mark. I wanted to open up for questions and um, I'll attempt to answer <laughs> those questions, but do we have any questions? Yes. Hold it close to your mouth. <laughs> okay. Hello. I've been doing some tours and people are very interested in your works. And one of the questions that has come up is that large piece that 12 panel, yes. how long did that take you to complete? That took me uh, several weeks to complete all the panels, but each individual panel, uh, because that's a reductionist piece and I'm racing against the clock for time, so each panel had to be completed in less than an hour, which is why that is such a high failure rate painting. So I'm racing against the clock to draw each one of those lines, to reduce each one of those lines, intersect to compose it laying flat and I have to wait till it dries to put it upright and so each individual panel about an hour mm -hmm. in order to compose the entire painting over over several weeks. Over several weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay and the other question that that has come up is how do you get the exact pattern to match each panel? <laughs> that's all by hand. Wow. There is that yes and so that's one of the things about my paintings is and I think one of the misnomers about painting is the simpler a painting is, the harder it is to execute. And so the reason being is that when you're uh, stripping away all of the color and the composition form, so and this is not to take away at all from any of the figurative artists or representational artists that are doing portraits and, and this intricate detail, that's not to take away from that whatsoever. But the simpler that a painting is, the harder it is to execute. And so many, many times, like even with the painting that we have here, um, you know, it's just repetition. It's repetition over and over and over again. And so when you have the final painting, um, it may have taken me 10 or 20 years to have developed the process and to repeat the process over and over again. 
the paint beading pieces that are there, the ones that there's a gold one and a white one that has kind of that starburst pattern. Yes. So that paint beading process, I'm almost painting it blind. Okay, so the color that it actually is is not the color that I'm using, like it, because it changes so dramatically. The other thing is it has to dry and then it has to cure. So dry is it's dry to the touch. Cure is that it's now completely solid all the way through. And so many, many times um, I have done a painting like that and spent weeks doing it. And the last few uh, beads of paint do not dry or cure correctly and I have to shred the entire thing. So humidity impacts, impacts it. I've learned not to do those on a rainy day. Even though I'm in a climate controlled studio, um, it's one of those things where I have to be really, really careful about the um, environmental areas of it and then it has to, to dry in a very, very pristine way. I was at the Dallas Art Fair uh, several years ago and there was a piece that's this giant solid pink square that had been resined. And it was, you know, a six-figure piece. And people would look at it and go, oh, I don't understand why that's a six-figure piece. And I was drawn to it immediately. And so someone was standing next to me, and they're like, okay, explain this to me. Why is this six figures? And I said, well, in order to get that pink, that's multiple layers of paint. So that is not a naturally occurring color in um, nature. So, so that was multiple, multiple layers. It would not have surprised me that was 10 or 20 layers of paint to get that intense, bright, vivid pink. Then, this is a, a, a maybe six foot by eight foot piece. Um, in order to resin that piece, he ha the artist had to create a clean room. One single piece of lint dropping into that resin and that entire piece would have been ruined. Okay, so super, super simple as far as its composure and its color very, very difficult to execute, very expensive to execute. And so that goes back to the simpler uh, uh, pieces, sometimes the harder it is to execute. Okay. So, Thank uh, you. The other yeah. question I uh -huh. have is about your puzzles. Now, okay. are those actual puzzles that you have purchased and then have made your different designs, especially the one at the Sistine Chapel? I was yes. wondering about that. Yes, yes. So uh, that's a great question. Um, as far as, uh, and you've referred it to a Sistine Chapel, so I don't actually title my paintings. It's a number designation um, based on the approximate date I either started or finished the piece, but I do nickname my pieces. And so that one is nicknamed the Sistine Chapel because it is actually a puzzle. It's an Italian puzzle of the Sistine Chapel. And so it's actually six boxes of a thousand pieces. <laughs> That's why I know how many pieces that are in there. And the composure of that particular piece, it's actually designed to be hung multiple ways. And um, so that particular one forms a square with another square at an angle inside of it, for those of uh, people that are streaming in live that can't see it. But I think it's on the, Marcy, is it on the website that they can see that piece? Or I'm no, not sure, not. Not, not yet, okay. Um, but anyway, that particular piece, the inspiration point is as children, you know, that, that if you go to a church and the church that we went to had these beautiful stained glass windows. And so I always looked at the windows and we were kind of in awe of the artists that created the windows. So even as a child, it's like, how did they do that and what was that? And so I was actually reading about the Sistine Chapel and um, Michelangelo's commission and the Pope that did that and kind of the, the challenges that he had to do in order to create the ceiling. And the reason why the Pope wanted the ceiling painted is he wanted people metaphorically to be looking up. And so it was not just the ceiling, but also the windows. And so I had a dream after reading this article, and that painting is the dream that I had because I wanted to create the ceiling and the window, the ceiling and the window. And so it's shaped to be a window to look through. So you can see the wall behind it. So the idea being is you look actually past it. You weren't supposed to be looking just at the stained glass windows are just at the ceiling. The idea was to get you to look beyond that. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay, any other questions? Oh, we have another question. Yes. This is a fascinating painting, but I just wanted to ask you, sorry. <laughs> I'm loud though. You know? Yeah. Um, oh, that's much loud. <laughs> you said the glaze dries white. So is the glaze the line, the, 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 the line, you know, the separation of the 15 pieces, or is the glaze the pattern? 
the glaze is the pattern, but if you look at this particular piece, if you look at the center of each panel, mm -hmm. most people see a plus sign or mm -hmm. cross sign. Mm -hmm. If you look at the corners, focus your eyes on the corners of the panel, and now you start to see squares. So it's somewhat of an optical illusion as well. And so um, I really believe strongly in an artist and viewer collaboration. It's the reason why I don't sign the front of my paintings. Um, and I do believe that uh, for collectors, and I'm, I consider myself an art collector as well, is that you become eye blind to it. No matter how much you love a piece when you bring it home and you're so excited about it, eventually you just kind of walk by it and it, you don't really notice it and it's not there. And so I design my paintings so that um, you can hang them different ways, you can move them to different rooms, and what I want is for you to see one thing at a distance, and then when you get up closer to the painting, I want you to see something else. And so in a way, I think my goal as an artist is to draw you in, because art is subjective, right? And so, but I also think it's experiential. It's why I don't sell my paintings online. I use a lot of neutrals, I use a lot of metallics, and those are just notoriously difficult to photograph. This painting, even with a professional photographer, it, it's very hard. There's some hot spots in it. It's a very difficult piece to photograph just by its size, but then the, the tone on tone with the shiny and the matte also because it's reflecting light very differently. But um, that's one of the uh, favorite techniques I have is I want to create a, this optical illusion. But the glazing technique is uh, wherever you look is what you see. And so you can see the pluses, you can see the squares, you can see the matte, or you can see the varnish part. And so when you look at it, I hope that it looks differently every time you see it. So, okay, any other, any other questions? Oh, yes. Oh, okay, hang on for the mic. <laughs> In that painting, I'm curious, the lines that you have, do you need to use a ruler or is that everything by freehand? Um, that is measured, so I do measure it and then um, I do mask it off in order to create the, the hard, sharp lines. And so that, <laughs> that was one of my most difficult experimentations in being able to be able to create the lines but not be able to create these hard, hard edges. But then also, anytime you use masking, those of the artists that are in here that use any masking mediums, it will always bleed somewhat. And so there's a lot of touch up on a painting like that. And then the other thing too, because, um, and you'll see the white, white lines is actually the wall behind the painting. And um, so those are individual 36 by 36 inch panels. So uh, one of the reasons I did this painting this way is I have done the very, very large single canvases and I've paid more to have the canvas delivered to my house and then from my house than I paid for the canvas just because you, you can't put a nine foot by 15 foot painting in, in just any, any truck. That particular painting, because it's done in panels, I can put in the back of my Jeep and take wherever I need to take it. And so that was the practicality of it. Um, one of the questions I get asked is uh, a lot is why so much black? <laughs> and the reason why I use so much black, one, it's my happy color, but also two, when, uh, when you know, my husband and I were much younger and didn't have a lot of money and I loved art, I loved art for, you know, ever since the day I discovered it, um, I couldn't find the paintings that I had in my head. And I think that's why so many artists become artists, is you have a vision inside your head of what you want to see, what makes you happy, what, what draws you in. And when you don't see that and you're an artist, I think that draws you and compels you to say, I need to create this. This does not exist in the world today, so therefore I need to create it. And so, um, you know, now you have Pierre Slalage, who's head of Distinguished Queer. There's a lot of artists that have used and leaned on black very heavily within their, um, in, within their body of work. It is a difficult, difficult medium. And then also, too, is like it becomes challenging for me is how do I do black in a different and innovative way? And so 40 years later, uh, you know, I still feel like there's ideas that I haven't executed that I haven't done yet. So thank you for thank your you. question.
I do have a question about your technique with the iron filings. Could you explain that a little bit? Do you use with the, the paint one? with the iron filings and the beading? Oh, yes. So uh, the paint beading process is one. Um, so I apply the different individual beads of paint, and there's a mica flake in here. And I actually, um, I'm going to admit this on here, and, and to all of you, but nobody tell anybody, I actually stole this process from a, a very well-known car manufacturer. And so when you're dealing with metallic flake, it, it reflects all different ways. And what I learned from them is that they actually used magnets to pull the flake the direction that they wanted. So all the flake is going the same direction. And so the paint beading process requires me to apply each individual bead of paint. And then I have to wait for the paint to be somewhat dry, but not completely dry. And then I use uh, magnets in order to pull the flake the direction that I want it to go. Because if I didn't, it would reflect light all different ways. And so the radiant kind of starburst pattern that is out there, even in the rings that are in there, um, I debuted a new series here called the Full Heart Series for the Irving Art Center. Um, those are, it's the same process. And so the, that process of, of, of pulling the magnetic flake can be perilous. If the paint is too wet, it moves the paint. And everything that I just did is ruined. If it's too dry, it doesn't pull the, mag the mica flake the direction I need to. So it's again one of those very high failure, <laughs> tedious, um, paintings that, that I'm just drawn to. And so out of that type of painting, one in three make it through the editing process. So um, my overall um, editing is a third of the paintings. Even now, 40 years later, don't make it through the editing process. That one, one out of three makes it. And so I don't know why I'm trying to <laughs> keep doing that. I'm a glutton for punishment, I guess. But thank you for asking the question about that. Any other questions? No? Okay, well gosh, I think I did this in record time. Well, I mean, if, if we have, I do have a couple of things that I do want to, to uh, touch on. So are, are anybody here art collectors? Collect art? Just art enthusiasts? Okay, we do have a couple of art collectors. Enthusiasts? Supporters of the art. Well, thank you. I want to say that to all of you. Um, I will mention to everybody, we've all just gone through this pandemic, um, and we were all in the same storm, but we were in very different boats. And I just want to put a plea out there for all the artists, um, is that we lost a lot of really great artists during this pandemic. And, and because of the fact that they could not afford to continue their studio spaces, I have a friend that's an artist in New York, and he hasn't sold a painting in more than two years. And so if you haven't sold a painting and that is your, your method of income, um, it, it's become very difficult. And so a lot of artist friends that, that I have has, have to give up their studios and get what they call real jobs, which means you know, join the corporate world. And it's soul crushing for them to have that. On top of that, um, supply chain issues, um, the rising cost, the inflation have hit the art community very, very hard. And so um, I just want to kind of remind everybody, support your artists. And no matter how much you may compliment an artist painting, um, the ultimate compliment is when you actually pay for that painting and doing that. And you know, art is um, all over the, the uh, place from a price standpoint. And so you know, there are the investment grade artists and the blue chip artists. And I know that I fall in that kind of investment grade art. My art is at a very high price point because I don't do prints. I don't repeat my paintings in doing that. Um, but, but what I tell everybody is keep going until you find an affordable price point for, for art that you love. And when you find that, don't hesitate to buy that for the arts community, it's, it's critical. And so I was explaining to um, actually my agent who is here today, uh, I, the Full Heart series, I, I did a series that's a purple, which is of the colors <laughs> that, that are out there. It's my personal favorite, has been my favorite since I was a kid. I think my sister's listening in online so she can vouch for that. But um, the tube of violet paint that I need to mix the color of purple that I did for this particular um, series of purple paintings is $200 for a tube that's less than an ounce. And it took more than one tube to do that. 
And so I will say that for all of us artists, and especially the ones that have continued to, to work through the pandemic, and I've been very, very fortunate because I have a, a, a great partner in this, but um, just continue to support the arts, even the Irving Art Center like this that was closed for a period of time, that are doing so much work on behalf of artists to get them exposure, to get their name out there, to give them an opportunity to, for the event space. I will say as a, as a working artist, I don't take that for granted because it's, it takes a, a whole village of people to advocate and support the arts in all forms. And so I just would put that play out there for all of you that continue to support your artists, go to their shows, uh, follow them on their Instagram accounts, um, like what they're post putting out into the world, to the docents that are doing all the tours and, and trying to uh, convey what we as artists go through in order to put our vision onto a canvas or into a piece of sculpture and do that. We appreciate you so much for advocating on behalf of us when we're not able to be here, to be here in person. And I wanna take a time to do a shout out to Marcy Enman, who's a dream curator <laughs> to, to work with and the Irving Art Center and everything it's done to support and promote the arts from the high school level and the student shows that have been here because I know as a, as a high school artist and how thrilled I was when a piece was, was picked and I was fortunate because I had a, a, an art teacher that believed in me and without my knowledge submitted my portfolio to the Kansas City Art Institute. And this was a recurring theme in my life was like, oh, if he, he knew that if he had asked me, I would have said, no, I'm not ready, I'm not good enough, right? And so he did it, and I won the scholarship out of um, several hundred art students in the Kansas City area that year. I think four of us received that scholarship. And I was very fortunate because one of my instructors was Hugh Merrill, who went on to have his own amazing art career. And so to have been in that lucky intersection of being instructed by somebody who would go on to become this amazing, amazing artist, and how he poured into the students to encourage us that while I went for printmaking processes, it was the genesis and informs my paintings today. The painting that's on this screen right now, the tone on tone, that's working backwards. That's working backwards is what is the end result that I'm trying to get. Printmaking taught me that. What kind of paper will I need? What kind of ink will I need? What kind of equipment will I need? What's the environment that I have to create in order to make this painting come into fruition? And that was something that I was taught in a really wonderful environment where we had museum grade world-class instructors teaching us to do that and so that was very very important for us in the in the in the art community and for the artists going there so anyway if there aren't any other questions i guess we can conclude is it okay to conclude early <laughs> absolutely already and then if we can take a quick break and anybody who does want to go through the um the artist guided tour of the gallery space, okay, I'm seeing some heads now. We have a few people who'd like to do that. And there is some sandwiches and snacks still over there, so please help yourself. And thank you all for coming. And everybody that's online, thank you for logging in. Woohoo! appreciate that. I hope I didn't put you to sleep. <laughs> so thank you, appreciate it.